Hello, I'm Nancy Rowe from Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, and I'm at the fourth CLDF Liver Connect meeting. I'm joined with two of my colleagues after the cirrhosis session. Hi, Nancy. Uh, my name is Andrew DeLimos, and I uh, am a transplant hepatologist in Charlotte, North Carolina at Atrium Health Wake Forest University. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. My name is Chatur Acharya. I'm a transplant hepatologist at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. So for a little context, our session that we just finished um, dealt with an individual who had metabolic and possibly alcohol-related liver disease and cirrhosis. So I'm going to start with the first point, which is how do you recognize someone who's got well-compensated cirrhosis that's then declining? Um, are there non-invasive tests that we can use, or what do you like to, to use to assess the patient that might be getting sick in front of you? Andrew? Well, to me, the initial thing that I look at is the clinical exam features. Uh, for example, uh, worsening ascites or uh, the development of perhaps covert hepatic encephalopathy um, as opposed to overt hepatic encephalopathy. And uh, then, of course, things, uh, clinical biochemical parameters that we, we would look at would be platelets, uh, platelet count dropping, for example, um, or, uh, you know, other non-invasive tests that you can do potentially that have been shown to be associated with decompensation or, or increasing uh, elastography scores based on fiber scan, for example. Dr. Ochara? I agree, yes. So firstly, clinically, I guess imaging to suggest whether they have development of cirrhosis, peeled edema, clinically with having symptoms of covert hepatic encephalopathy. And then I, I do make it a practice that I to check a, a fiber scan on everybody just to ensure that, you know, we know that with the higher kilopascal score, we know that there's a higher risk of having worse outcomes in the predicts mortality. So I pretty much make it a practice to check everyone, uh, send them for a fiber scan. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also really important when we look at the patient in front of us to look at that longitudinal information. It's one thing to see platelet counts of 75. It's another thing to notice that they were 100 the year before and 150 the year before that. And so I mm -hmm. think that all of these tools are, are really helpful if you're looking at them in the trajectory of the patient. Yeah, I agree. I think that the, the, the delta in labs are, is something that's very important. I always find it funny that oftentimes you're given labs in isolation and really you know, as clinicians, we know that uh, looking at labs over over time is really critical in in assessing a patient's risk for decompensation. Absolutely. Well, the second part of the session revolved around hepatic encephalopathy, so clearly a sign of decompensation. And although it concentrated on refractory encephalopathy, which we did not necessarily have consensus on the definition, I'll start with how often do you have a patient that is truly refractory for a minute? from hepatic encephalopathy? Infrequently. Infrequently. Uh, I think as you alluded to during this session, Nancy, uh, there are typically a precipitant uh, for the encephalopathy to uh, end up being uh, categorized as refractory, meaning if you delve into the, the patient clinical history, uh, hopefully you can get to some precipitant, whether they perhaps had recent doubling of their diuretics and perhaps they were volume depleted and that drove some of their uh, their more, more recent presentation of hepatic encephalopathy, for example. Yes, definitely. No, I, I hardly see a true, a true, you know, refractory hepatic encephalopathy patient. It's most of the times, if you look at the data from the Naxal cohort, you know, we saw that most of the readmissions for hepatic encephalopathy were related to medication non-compliance and, you know, mm -hmm medication, wrong medications being used, opioids, things of like that. So mm -hmm. it's always, there's always that extra component that before you label somebody as refractory hepatic encephalopathy, you know, family, getting a good history from patients, caregivers, medication, conciliation, all that's so important before you can actually truly label someone as refractory hepatic encephalopathy. Agree. Now, we did have representation of the developer of MELD at our conference, right? Mm -hmm. And we all recognize that MELD is a really important tool, um, but some of our patients have multiple forms of decompensation and their MELD is still low. Um, how do you address that patient? Oh, that's, that's a very, very tough one, right? And especially your, your MASH patient who doesn't seem to have a high MELD score. It, if, if living donors, I mean, we always talk about transplants, so we're lucky, I'm fortunate that in my center we do have living donors, so that's something I do bring up. The uptake hasn't been great, unfortunately, but we do try. That's that's one option. 
obviously if you're dealing with encephalopathy, tips is not a good idea when, when you <laughs> for these patients. But it's the quality of life. Honestly, many of these patients, it's, we have to focus on trying to improve their quality of life even though we can't offer them a transplant. So that means, you know, right medications for encephalopathy, making sure that they're volume controlled, uh, and, you know, exercise, physical exercise, all these other things that we can potentially help improve the quality of life while we wait for them to get to that st- transplant status. Yeah, I mean, this is a very difficult topic, yeah. uh, the, the, the meld uh, purgatory discussion or having uh, significant portal hypertensive related complications without a meld score reflecting the, the degree of the portal hypertensive uh, issues. And, uh, you know, I think obviously there's been a lot of literature in our field recently about the importance of setting these patients up, particularly their loved ones and family members with palliative care to really address the 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 chronic symptom management and really the the empathic care that that our patients uh, need in this situation. Yeah, I think we don't always do a great job talking about prognosis. Um, every mm. one of these features is a suggestion that this patient is not going to do well for the next one, three, five years. And yet we concentrate so much on symptomatology that we may not actually communicate that big picture to the family. But I'll, um, I'll take another, you know, even before that, our patients are often pretty well when they're going home from the hospital. It's that transition from home and then coming back into either the emergency room or into clinic where things kind of fall apart. How do you manage that discharge? Like, is there a toolkit that you can, that you use or a way to help that transition of care um, happen more successfully? Unfortunately, you know, that's another problem with discharges, right? That's why we have so many readmissions. So we did try to get a nurse involved once we got a pilot grant where we had a nurse follow up with these patients to prevent readmissions. We have a nurse who actually follows up with the patient upon discharge in our in our center, but it's only to ensure a follow-up visit. But, but And we obviously try to get them into see us in the clinic within the next two to four weeks from discharge with a nurse practitioner, if possible. So leveraging EPPs for a good follow-up and then... I, it's a tough, you know, it's a very, very tough situation because healthcare systems don't always approve these extra roles. So it's just challenging, but, you know, you know, informing the caregivers, getting them on board to recognize symptoms of, you know, decompensation is very important. So good education upon discharge is so important. I'm going to put the last question to you then, because I, I think we are not going to solve discharge very easily. <laughs> um, the last session was on surgical clearance, um, which I think is not clearance, right, but actual risk assessment. How do you approach that? Because this is a frequent question for hepatologists. I see at least five to 10 patients a month with cirrhosis where I'm asked to uh, restratify them for elective surgery. And obviously, um, at this point, I am, uh, I do follow the, the vocal pen criteria typically to help restratify these patients and have a very clear conversation with the patient um, that uh, I don't clear them for surgery. I discuss the risks explicitly, increased risk of bleeding, infection, decompensation, encephalopathy, and death. And uh, depending on the degree of the risk score and the uh, outcomes based on that uh, assessment really couches my uh, level of um, of recommendation as far as uh, how persistent in recommending and not recommending surgery. Now, the older guidelines really prevented a lot of people who had cirrhosis from needing surgery, and I think, uh, fortunately, the vocal pen score has allowed uh, providers to... Per- be able to provide a more accurate assessment for patients who really may need surgery. Do you find that your interventionalists are frustrated when you don't say, yes, this person is cleared, but actually give them a risk assessment? <laughs> yes, definitely. It's, it's, it's a big decision all the time, pretty much. Uh, can I ask another question, though? Uh, bring on the topic of, the, do you, when you get this you know, a decompensated cirrhotic patient, do you think about a TIPS versus beta blocking them to alleviate that risk of portal hypertension that the surgeon is so worried about? What's your practice? Typically, do you recommend a TIPS if it's an applicable patient or do you think this beta blocking is good enough? Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a little bit of data on preventive, preventive TIPS. Yeah. I've not generally been in favor of, of doing it unless there are some 
reasonable indications to justify the tips at baseline. But just for the surgery itself, I'm not sure that I would recommend it right now. Yeah, The AASLD guidelines clearly state that a tip should not be placed as a bridge to make surgical risk better. That does not mean that we don't sometimes place tips in patients that we think are high risk for volume complications or decompensation um, from surgery. I think the data that you're talking about really looks at people who had tips already and the patients that had tips um, did better with abdominal surgery and I think cardiothoracic surgery than patients that did not have tips, but the tips was not placed as a bridge for surgery. All right. I want to thank you both. Um, I want to encourage anyone who's listening to this to please come to Liver Connect number five next year, always in a great location. Um, And thank you very much. 